we are uh, very uh, pleased and, and happy uh, to welcome the Honorable Neil Schmidt, a member of the uh, German Bundestag. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Schmidt is a member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and the Committee for Transport and Digital Inter Infrastructure um, in, the, uh, in the Bundestag. Uh, he is also a speaker on foreign policy for uh, the SPD parliamentary group. Uh, you have a full, uh, a full uh, bio of uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Schmidt in your, in your pamphlet. So uh, without uh, further ado, let me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Schmidt to come to the podium and speak. Uh, afterwards, we will have a uh, brief moderated conversation and uh, also have an opportunity to open the floor for your questions. Dr. Schmidt. Thank you, Gerald, for this kind introduction. Thanks uh, to uh, the MIE and uh, to the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Washington for in inviting me and for organizing this conference every year. And uh, I'm really glad uh, to contribute to promoting the discussion uh, uh, on Turkey and on uh, Turkish politics here in Washington because I'm convinced that uh, Turkey needs also some attention uh, from Washington, not only from Europe, which is uh, geographically located uh, more closely uh, to Turkey and maybe which has also maybe a broader um, um, relationship with Turkey. Um, I want to uh, do my introductory remarks um, uh, by stressing uh, three points um, which underline in my sense the decline of Erdogan's power. So uh, he has already reached uh, uh, the apex of his power and now his power uh, is weakened uh, due to three factors, the economic crisis, the dysfunctional presidential system and the unraveling of his party and uh, the, the rise of the opposition parties. The economic crisis is a big blow to Erdogan because one of the foundations of his power was the promise to um, increase prosperity and employment uh, for Turkey as a whole. And when the AKP, AKP took uh, uh, power, um, unemployment was uh, at about 8%. Now it's more than 14% in official statistics and youth unemployment is even higher. And if you go to regions like the Abakir, where I went uh, at the end of October, uh, you may find uh, unemployment, much, much higher unemployment, especially among uh, uh, the young generation, up to 50 or more percent. And um, he lost his economic team. So I followed the debate just on, on the panel and um, you are right in stressing that not only Babacan is out of office now, but even more importantly, so um, his former finance minister, Mehmet Cimsek, who was the guy who collected the money for finance in Turkey by touring uh, capitals uh, uh, in, in the Western world. And now um, there is no real economic team in place. Second reason for the weakening of Erdogan's power is the dysfunctional presidential system, which was supposed to strengthen uh, Erdogan's clout uh, on Turkish politics, but in fact, does not really work properly. In fact, it weakened uh, well-established uh, bureaucratic and ministerial institutions like the, the foreign ministry, the finance ministry, governmental institutions uh, more generally. And um, it takes a very long time to uh, make decisions uh, in the Sarai, in the presidential palace in, in Ankara. And uh, this leads uh, to, to a lack of decision making and uh, to a less cohesive um, uh, working of, of government in, in general. Um, and especially in times of crisis, like nowadays in Turkey, uh, this is to the detriment of uh, the political performance of the incumbent uh, governments, uh, I'm convinced. And third factor is the unraveling of AKP. So f for, f from the founding of uh, uh, this party, this was one of the 
probably the most impressive political machines in uh, in Turkish history because it has a it it had and still has a broad base, and it used to have several wings. So you have a liberal wing, you had a social, uh, rather social oriented uh, wing, and also, of course, the uh, Islamic conservative wing. And uh, part of this uh, party is now uh, leaving. So uh, Babacan was mentioned, Davutoglu was mentioned. When I was in Ankara at the end of October, I met uh, Mustafa Yenoğlu, one of the leading uh, AKP parliamentarians, uh, just one day after he left uh, the party, and uh, many members of the founding generation of um, uh, AKP are, uh, has already left uh, the party. And probably the most important figure behind the scenes is uh, Abdullah Gül. And so now the question is, uh, what will be the um, uh, the fate of these uh, dissident uh, parties, and um, I believe that the conservative dissidents of uh, RKP needs a leading figure. <laughs> and uh, from my uh, conversations in in Turkey uh, uh, this year, um, I feel and I fear that for the time being. There is not such a strong leading figure uh, among the AKP dissidents that might unite uh, this uh, AKP um, uh, split. Um, and um, I've been know uh, I've known uh, Abdullah Gül for some years now, and I met him uh, uh, also in, in Istanbul. And I think he's not ready for 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 doing this job. But there are many people expect him to do that because he might be the only one to unite all these conservative um, center-right uh, uh, movement uh, in opposition to, to AKP. And then we have, of course, the left-wing opposition, uh, which uh, had a, a strong showing at the local elections and uh, a new star is born, Mamulu, Ekrem Mamulu, And um, I believe that uh, CHP and HDP uh, uh, have been working quite well together at these local elections and that there is an, uh, a chance for uh, CHP, uh, for the CHP party, the Social Democratic Party, our sister party, I must say, um, to, to uh, evolve. And um, al although they are f focusing on domestic policy issues, so when I talked to Ekrem Imamoglu in Istanbul uh, this summer, he told me that he he was not so much interested to, to seeking confrontation uh, with Erdogan over the uh, foreign policy issue, but rather to attack him on uh, the social and economic uh, policy issues, which might be a smart strategy in, in Turkey <laughs> these days. Um, Imamoglu uh, made a very smart move in August when he uh, went to Diyarbakir defending the elected mayors who were evicted from office by the central government, HDP mayors, and uh, showing solidarity with these uh, elected, elected uh, officials uh, in southeast uh, Turkey. And this was new. This was not the traditional thing to do for a GHP politician. And that's why I believe um, uh, the opposition, the social democratic opposition and uh, HDP can learn a lot from the Istanbul local elections and um, probably Ekrem Imamoglu showed the way how to win elections uh, uh, for the opposition in, in Turkey. And although political oppression uh, is on the rise in Turkey, um, you still have civil society out there. And uh, if you look at one of the latest move, or one of the strongest movements in civil society, society the uh, the ballot boxes watching movement, uh, supervising the elections and uh, uh, the, the, the guaranteeing the secrecy of elections and the um, correct accounting of um, uh, elections. Um, you see that there is still quite a strong uh, civil society fighting for freedom of the media, fighting for um, uh, free elections, and we should not forget about that, although we know that they are under he heavy pressure. 
So these three, three factors explain in my view that um, not that Erdogan's reign is over or will end soon, but that he has been definitely weakened and he will not uh, regain his uh, uncontested uh, strength we were used to see in the, in the last uh, 10 uh, to 15 years. Now he has taken a, a, for, for some years a very authoritarian turn, which is of high concern to us in Germany and Europe. And um, un unlike in the first 10 years of his uh, tenure, um, he has no positive political agenda. It's more or less about uh, 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 his political survival. It's less about a transformative agenda for Turkey as we saw uh, in the first decade of the new uh, millennium uh, with uh, economic reforms, also political reforms uh, uh, being implemented in, in Turkey. And uh, so what, should, what policy recommendations um, shall we draw from this uh, uh, situation? One is, once again, learn from Ekrem Imamoglu in Istanbul don't pick up personal fights with Erdogan because that's what he likes, that's what he's up to. He needs these enemies from within or from uh, abroad uh, to paint himself as the strong leader of Turkey. And um, Ekrem Imamoglu avoided any personal attack on Erdogan and won the election. And um, so what we've experienced in Europe in the last few years, well, a, a series of even sometimes insulting uh, uh, personal attacks on Chancellor Merkel, on our foreign minister some weeks ago, uh, lately on, uh, on uh, President Macron. Uh, uh, and um, we should not respond on that level because what Erdogan needs is to have these enemies. And more and more citizens in Turkey are fed up with this kind of polit uh, political or tactical uh, um, uh, deals, uh, way of, of dealing uh, uh, things. And so we should not feed into uh, his, uh, in, into Erdogan's uh, narrative about being a strong leader um, opposing the West or uh, enemies uh, from, from Europe or from the US. Um, second thing to do, I know that also in, in the US there's a debate on, on sanctions, um, but we should never forget that Turkey is well um, embedded in Euro-Atlantic structures and we should not give up on Turkey and should preserve these Euro-Atlantic structures. That means NATO membership, customs union, and EU accession talks. We, should, uh, we shouldn't terminate any of these uh, because there is a Turkey beyond er Erdogan. So we should not only perceive Turkey through the lenses or the lens of, his, uh, pre uh, of, of the, the president and his poli policies, uh, but there are many people, millions of people in Turkey still setting their hopes, their trust into Europe, into the West, uh, into the Euro-Atlantic alliance uh, Turkey has been in uh, for the last uh, 60 years. Um, if there are any measures to be taken, and there are, and we've seen that after the incursion in Northern Syria with the arms embargo by the European Union, and the postponement of a huge Volkswagen investment in Izmir, which was a very smart move from Volkswagen, not instigated by the German government, but um, instigated or triggered by reputational risks associated with uh, uh, investments in Turkey these days for any private, uh, uh, any, any uh, listed company um, um, uh, in Germany or Europe. So then there should be uh, this kind of targeted measures, but uh, we should not uh, put into question these um, foundations, the very foundations of uh, the uh, relationship between Turkey and the West. And the last point I would like to made, make is support civil society. This is a very important point. Reach out to civil society, um, reach out to local governments, 
very important point, and more specifically, help Ekremi Mamulu, because he's the mayor of the by far largest city in, in, uh, in Turkey, but also the other mayors help them to, to fund their projects because the local elections showed the strength of local democracy in Turkey. And uh, local democracy is the very foundation of democracy itself. And so the success of the newly elected mayors in uh, Turkish big cities is crucial to the preservation of democracy in Turkey more, more generally. And so I believe that uh, from the European side, but also from the US side, we, sh we should think about ways how to, find, uh, how to fund infrastructure projects directly in, in Turkish cities. Um, having, uh, uh, knowing that uh, the Turkish government is uh, diminishing funds for Istanbul, and now even uh, state-owned banks in Ankara uh, have declared to uh, stop uh, uh, financing uh, the, the, the Istanbul city government. So I believe this would be a very concrete um, uh, support uh, for democracy in, in Turkey. So I'm pleased to, to uh, discuss all these uh, things with you, and um, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you for your attention. come up and uh, have a mic you. Okay. <laughs> well, you'll mic yourself, maybe. Okay. It, it, okay, it sounds like it works. Okay, is well, it okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, so thank you very much for, uh, for that uh, presentation and very um, thoughtful remarks. But I wanted to go back and, and I, I think that the um, uh, this conference and, and your comments are, uh, are particularly appropriate at this moment. Uh, the, uh, the NATO summit is just wrapping up in, in London. And, uh, and Turkey uh, and what to do about Turkey was at the top of the agenda. Uh, we saw what uh, President Macron had to say uh, about it the, uh, the other day. Uh, President Trump met with, uh, with uh, Erdogan earlier today, and according to the uh, Turkish uh, readout, it was a very productive meeting, they said, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and, uh, and, so, um, and so where we're going to go about Turkey uh, within the NATO context is, is certainly going to be very important. Germany obviously will have a big voice in whatever decisions are made. Uh, your uh, comments, I, I must say, without uh, uh, being insulting, I think, uh, place you very close to the Donald Trump view of how to go forward on, on uh, Turkey, which is to try to preserve uh, its role to, uh, to work through some of these issues. Uh, but, uh, but the reality is that Turkey has presented uh, NATO with a dilemma, with several dilemmas. Uh, not only the issue of the S-400, uh, but also, of course, uh, what's happening in, um, in northern Syria uh, and the challenges that that places uh, for Europe in particular. Uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, Erdogan's threat to not observe Article 5 uh, requirements uh, in terms of the Baltic states unless there is reciprocity on the Kurdish issue. So. Understanding what the challenges are uh, and, and accepting your, your view that, uh, that we should try to, uh, to uh, work through these issues without breaking uh, the relationship in a permanent way, how do you, how do you see uh, the right way forward? Yeah, well, you're right uh, in mentioning all these issues sort of piling up. And I believe this is the main problem in, in our relations with Turkey right now. So I guess there's still a, a general consensus that we should not push Turkey out of NATO. And um, we, we, we might find solutions to some of these uh, issues that have been piling up for the last uh, few years. But it has become increasingly difficult because 
there are, even, there are uh, ever more of them, and not a single one has been resolved. Mm. This is, in my view, one of the, 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 the basic problems of, of our relationship with Turkey. And we have to avoid a situation which I've I've come to know in our relationship uh, with Russia, which is that we have divergent or even opposing narratives about what was going or what has been going on in the last five or, or six years um, from the Turkish side and from the Western side. Um, because in the case of Russia, we sort of have to accept it and Russia is not a NATO ally. But in, in, in the case of Turkey, having a Turkey a, as an ally within NATO and to some extent within the European Union as well, through the customs union, this is a very, very um, worrisome development to have divergent narratives and to have a decreasing readiness from Western policymakers to take into account legitimate security interests uh, of Turkey, for example, in Syria, for example, Tur uh, um, 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 uh, relating to PKK uh, or Kurdish terrorism. Uh, a, a sober debate on that is almost impossible because we have so, there's such a high level of frustration on the Western side and also on the European side on Iran's policies uh, towards, towards the Kurds, towards uh, the, the press, uh, towards the opposition in, in, in Turkey. And so I believe that we should try to, to uh, find solutions to some of these issues and the S-400 issue is a NATO issue. It, 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 for a very long time it has been treated as a bilateral issue between the US and Turkey but it concerns all of NATO, and so that's why I believe that there, has to be a, there must be a strong response uh, uh, from NATO on that and an attempt to, to, to um, bring in American technology or American uh, air defense systems and to, to bring or to at least uh, sort of uh, um, put put in a depository <laughs> the, the Russian uh, system, but we are losing time. We've already lost, uh, I, I would say, much time time on that. And as far as Article 5 is concerned, there, it has been clear from the start that uh, Turkish invasion in northern uh, Syria is not a good uh, uh, a solid uh, found, uh, foundation, uh, foundation for invoking Article 5. So there will be no help from NATO whenever there might arise a, a warlike situation uh, on, uh, between Turkey and Syria or Syrish, Syrish milit or Syrian-based military uh, entities. Uh, uh, and um, so I believe that uh, Erdogan will sooner or later um, step back from his uh, initiatives of halting uh, NATO military uh, involvement in the Baltics, uh, but this will take some time, but I believe that there's still a strong sentiment in Turkey to, to preserve um, the, the cohesion of NATO. One very explosive issue is the Cyprus issue, mm. especially in the context of the European Union. This is extremely explosive and um, this once again leads back to the to the to the feature of Erdogan's policy in raising the stakes and in being uh, in, 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 in in trying to define enemies because for a very long time the Cyprus issue was was more or less silenced in a way it was not solved but silenced and um, now uh, with the exclusive economic zone. Um, and the exploration uh, going on there, uh, it has become an issue and f for, for our European partners, not only for Germany, but for our European partners, this can be the starting point for a new round uh, of, of sanctions. So we, of, we already have had some sanctions in, in, in summer, so we stopped some of the negotiations with Turkey on a new um, um, air, air transport agreement and all this stuff, but this can, this can lead to, to, to tougher measures. And 
Um, so what I would like to see is to, to at least have a beginning of disentangling some of these uh, issues that have been piling up and I'm, I'm so first, I'm, I, I, don't like, I don't like being frustrated because um, uh, I'm, I'm still a friend of Turkey and it has become increasingly difficult to be, be a friend of Turkey, unfortunately, but still I try to, to mend fences and um, I, would, I would like to see some more progress made f uh, from the Turkish side because there is still, at least in government circles, not much understanding that for the need of substantial domestic reform in Turkey about the rule of law, about uh, media uh, freedom, of freedom of speech. Instead of that, they are just uh, attacking uh, more and more journalists. So the latest case was Hasan Cemal, who, 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 and so the, you know this. Or, or now they, they try to attack uh, T24, a very important uh, independent uh, news platform on the internet and uh, run by former Chumhurit journalists like Murat Sabunchu. And, and, uh, and so this, this makes it increasingly difficult for, for us Europeans uh, to, to solve any issue related to Turkey. And, so, and there have been so many words about just judicial reform and after the lifting of the emergency, state of emergency and all this stuff, but there were no deeds. And this, this makes, us, makes it so, so difficult for us to, to get uh, some, some things uh, moved uh, in the right direction uh, in our relationship with, with Turkey. Yeah. Well, you're right, and, and this goes back to, uh, to my friend Pat Theris' uh, question earlier on about, about the issue of, of Greece and, uh, and the increasingly confrontational nature of the yeah. relationship. Yeah. Uh, we've seen, of course, um, in the last few days, the announcement of this new a maritime agreement between Libya and Turkey that just adds to uh, the, uh, the risk. And, and we shouldn't lose sight, you're absolutely right, we should not lose sight of the fact that since the end of World War II, uh, the, uh, the only real uh, threat of armed conflict between two NATO members was between Greece, uh, Greece and Turkey. And so uh, this is an issue uh, that continues to boil uh, beneath the surface and, and is of concern to all of us. But it raises the question again, and, and I know that this was certainly the viewpoint of many people here in Washington in terms of, uh, of uh, Erdogan's uh, position on northern Syria and the desire to establish this safe zone uh, and to push um, Syrian uh, refugees back across the border into Syria out of Turkey, that, that to an extent uh, Erdogan is taking steps that are specifically designed to address his domestic political concerns without really um, taking into account the impact that they have on Turkey's international relations. And so the relationship with Russia, uh, what he's doing in, in Syria, uh, some of these other steps that are all meant to improve his domestic political standing at the cost of Turkey's international relationships. And that makes it very difficult for Turkey's international partners to really respond, doesn't it? Yeah, and that makes it very difficult to improve relations with Turkey in a substantial manner uh, because it seems that uh, nowadays uh, Erdogan is much more interested in um, maintaining his domestic image as a, a strong leader than in improving uh, relations with the EU. That is quite uh, uh, a, a difference a star is, is a stark difference to what he uh, had done ten years ago when he, there was a real push for EU membership. And um, but that said, I believe that we have to uh, to do everything we can not to um, worsen relations uh, from our side. So we, we know that we cannot really make much progress on many issues with the Erdogan in power, uh, but still there's a Turkey uh, uh, um, 
after, or there will be a Turkey after Erdogan, and this should be a, a NATO member, for example. So we, 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 there, there's a, sooner or later we will have to reconnect with Turkey in a way. And um, I believe that the northern Syria invasion, as you rightly mentioned, uh, was done mainly for uh, do, uh, domestic policy uh, uh, reasons. But still, you know, the idea of having strong Kurdish forces, armed forces, which are in some ways linked to PKK, um, this raises the specter of having Kurdish um, militants once again in northern Syria, as there were at the times of Hafiz al-Assad. So there, there were PKK camps in northern Syria uh, in a certain time. So I can, to a certain extent, I can understand uh, these um, concerns, security concerns uh, from, uh, from the Turkish government, but it was the wrong way of dealing with it by just uh, unilaterally uh, going over the border and invading parts of northern Syria. And we strongly opposed it, and for the first time, the EU governments declared it as illegal, uh, as contrary to international law. This was a very strong uh, move, to the surprise of, our, of, of the Turkish governments, by the way, because when they, inv when they invaded the Afrin area, there was no, not such a formal declaration from the uh, European Union. And we, are, we made perfectly clear that we expect Turkish uh, troops uh, to withdraw from Syrian territory, that there is no forced return of refugees in the, in, into these areas, that there is an unfent, un, unfettered access of international humanitarian aid uh, to these regions because of the 200,000 uh, uh, display, displaced persons there, and that there is a... Um, a political solution uh, to the conflict in Syria because uh, you cannot win this militarily. So, so what we are focusing on, on, on uh, now is uh, the, the constitutional uh, uh, process, constitutional convention being held in, in Geneva. And uh, we are promoting to bring in um, uh, PYD, uh, related persons into this constitutional assembly. For the time being, there are some other Kurdish representatives, but not from the, the northern part of Syria related to these uh, P, PYD uh, forces. And um, so uh, we, we need these, a political framework for, for, for the solution of, of, of the conflict. And um, what we should avoid at any, at any uh, in any case is to sort of legitimize the Turkish operation in northern Syria by establishing a safe zone under the conditions of Russia and Turkey. So there was a reasonable debate about establishing security zones in Syria some years ago, and at that time this might have helped. But not now, looking at the facts being created on the ground, um, it would be a very bad idea to now send UN troops into that situation, which might sort of legitimize and justify what Turkey and Russia are doing there. And uh, so that's why we're very skeptical uh, about uh, this idea, but there must be a, 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 uh, the full application of international law concerning the return of refugees and the uh, voluntary return of refugees into these areas, that's for sure. Um, I want to give uh, members of the audience an opportunity to ask their questions. Um, so uh, we'll go and do uh, that. But, um, uh, but let me ask you one last question uh, before, you know, while people are thinking uh, about their, their, own, uh, their own questions. And that is, for many years, of course, and, and the United States uh, long uh, supported from the outside, of course, the idea of Turkish integration into the EU. Uh, the, um, the prospect of that integration long helped to, to moderate and to govern Turkey's behavior, both domestically and internationally. Uh, that seems to be a, a bit of a dead letter right now. Do you see the, uh, the possibility? Do you see the possibility of entrance into the EU um, as, uh, as still something that's on the table? 
And do you believe that for the Turkish people, again, thinking beyond Erdogan, as you suggested, going beyond uh, you know, a post-Erdogan Turkey, do you think that that is still something that for the Turkish population is um, worth pursuing? I, I'm convinced that the concept is still fundamentally right to sort of uh, um, tie Turkey to the EU, and that's why we should not terminate uh, the accession talks. I know that under this government in Turkey, or under this kind of government in Turkey, um, it is impossible to continue the talks, so that's why they are frozen more or less, suspended. And we should keep them suspended because it's quite an incentive for the opposition in Turkey to fight for democracy and for Western values to have the possibility to continue these talks under a new government or under a changed uh, course of action uh, by, by any government in Turkey. I understand that in Europe there's a lot of skepticism about uh, joining, uh, about Turkey being a full-fledged member of, of the EU, but there is no better way of um, incorporating uh, Turkey into the, these structures. And the customs union is a sort of uh, intermediate step because the customs union allows Turkey to implement lots of EU rules. That's why we should also, also think of um, um, modernizing, updating and modernizing the, the customs union. Uh, the existing customs union has a lot of uh, deficiencies, so first we should tackle those and then maybe broaden uh, the customs union to other segments of the economy. Um, uh, but any alternative model would be perceived in Turkey as a, a step back from the European Union. And I believe that this would send a very negative signal to, to the uh, Turkish society as a whole. When it comes to the EU membership, we will see in what shape the EU will, the, the EU will have at that moment if there are different speeds of integration within the European Union or concentric circles of integration. So there might be, a, a, might be some graduated, graduated levels of integration within the European Union, as we already have with the Eurozone and the so-called Schengen space uh, of, um, uh, of uh, having no border controls uh, within uh, many of the EU uh, member states. So I believe there's still lots of room for defining the precise shape any uh, Turkey EU membership will take after the end of these uh, negotiations, but we should not give up on the, on the idea. Good, thank you. Um, Dr. Schmidt's time with us is very limited. Um, I will take three questions, and, um, and please make them very crisp. Uh, questions only, uh, this gentleman. Right here. Uh, Richard Coleman, CBP, retired. Uh, there was some uh, portrayal of uh, some leverage or implied leverage that Turkey has with respect to its uh, role in absorbing migrants and that uh, it has this leverage that uh, if, uh, with the European Union uh, in terms of dumping that problem back in the European Union. Would you comment on that? Okay. One. Uh, let's take a, a question, um, okay, over here, uh, this uh, uh, lady in uh, black. Um, I was curious how you see Erdogan's shift in approach to the Kurdish issue in Turkey and, and his counter PKK, counter YPG policies in Syria and Iraq. Um, that you sort of touched on uh, since 2015, how that's impacting the domestic political landscape in Turkey and Erdogan's own co consolidation or weakness of power, and also how that looks um, uh, amongst the opposition parties, both uh, existing oppos opposition parties and the 
AKP splinters that you mentioned in your opening remarks. Okay, and then one more. Let's uh, let's go back here, gentleman in the blue sweater. You have a short question. Okay. Hi, my name is John, and um, I'm doing a PhD in electromagnetics in George Washington uh, University. And my question is: There are now prisoners in Turkey captured in Syria, and they are ISIS terrorists with um, EU passports, including, for instance, German. Um, I read that their citizenship was revoked, and the uh, countries deny their extradition. Um, what should Turkey do with these people? Um, they are or were um, citizens of other countries and committed heinous crimes in another country, namely Syria. Should Turkey's prison and security system have to absorb these terrorists? Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. And then the last question uh, right here. Um, thank you very much. Paolo von Schirach, Global Policy Institute. You mentioned in passing at least uh, that the S-400 issue should be owned by NATO in a more forceful way. We haven't really seen that. It's been relegated as a bilateral issue between the United States and Turkey. Do you see any steps that can be taken at, uh, you know, from, from the NATO headquarters that the, that, the, that the NATO members would come together and condemn this? Or, because we haven't really seen that. So far, thank yeah, you. Okay, yeah. Thanks. okay I, I start with the last one. Uh, uh, Jens Stoltenberg was in Berlin two weeks ago and we talked about that and he told us that there were discussions within the NATO framework on that. I believe that we have to, to do it in a more formal way and maybe also in a strong, with a stronger wording um, because it concerns us as well. So uh, I believe that NATO is the right framework to, to, uh, to put more emphasis on this issue, so to say. Um, about the leverage, um, no, I take the, the, the ISIS terrorists first. Right. Um, I state clearly that European nations um, should take back their citizens for uh, persecutions, uh, for uh, judicial persecution uh, in Germany, in France, and elsewhere. This, we cannot leave it to Turkey or to Iraq or uh, Syria. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they are our citizens, and we expect from other countries that they take back their citizens, from Germany, for example, and so we, we have to do it uh, uh, on, on our side as well. So the, the, that's, and in Germany, there has been no revocation of citizenship, as far as I believe. There has been a debate in other European countries, but um, retrieving German uh, citizenship uh, uh, is a very sensitive issue because of German history. And that's why I'm not aware of any of such uh, case uh, uh, having happened in, in Germany. And uh, so, but, and I, I also admit that European governments, including the German government, have been too hesitant about this issue because they hoped that it would sort of be dis uh, solved by who whoever <laughs> over there <laughs> in Syria or in Turkey. I think you lost your mic here. Okay. <laughs> And um, the Kurdish question, well, I'm not in Erdogan's mind, but I believe that he has taken an authoritarian and more nationalist turn after he lost the majority of seats uh, at the elections in uh, 2015. That was the case. And um, this has also to do with um, a shift of strategy within AKP. For, for a very long time, AKP advocated the multicultural history and composition of, of Turkey. And uh, uh, especially after the coup attempt, 
but also after the loss of these elections, he turned to nationalistic uh, parties as a partner. And so there was, uh, once again, it was domestic about domestic policy strategy. And um, this is really a, a missed opportunity of historical dimensions because we must, we must uh, give credit Erdogan for the, the attempt to solve this issue. He was the first political leader in, in Turkey to trying to, to address this issue. Uh, but at the same time, we've also seen the limits of the approach at, at that uh, time because it was basically a military intelligence services uh, made uh, process. And if you want to really solve the Kurdish issue, you need to involve parliament and you need to involve all political forces in Turkey because it's, a, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not only a military issue, it has to do with Turkish society and Turkish politics. And uh, so, um, and after all, the plan was not too well figured out. So there were some aspects well um, uh, de debated and sort of concluded. But still, if you look at other peace plans in Colombia or Northern Ireland or whatever, they were much more precise and much more elaborated. And uh, I've been to the Abaka at the end of October. And the interesting thing is that HDP people and AKP people and the president of this uh, uh, chamber of uh, industry all told me that they wanted to see a political solution. So they, everybody knows in Turkey that you cannot end this conflict by military means. So you need a political solution. And unfortunately, a lot, a lot of uh, trust has been lost by the termination of this uh, first peace process and it will be very tough to rebuild confidence. Um, there are some institutions uh, doing so-called uh, track 1.5 uh, talks and uh, Belkov Foundation in Germany, for example, we are supporting them from our foreign office. Uh, but after all, it has to be solved by Turkey. We can only give some indirect support uh, from the outside. About the leverage uh, of, of the refugee, well, in European politics, especially in, in German politics, there's now a, a tendency to be afraid of migrants, of refugees coming in because we have had some trouble in, in, uh, in uh, um, uh, accommodating them and there has also been some drastic political consequence in, uh, in, uh, in the rise of AfD, AfD, a far right, uh, or even a racist party in, in, in Germany. But still, there is some leverage, but the leverage is not as high as it might seem because Erdogan cannot decide to just send three million people in, in, in one day to Europe. Yeah? So this will just not work uh, in, a, in, a physio, in a purely physical manner. Many of these refugees do not want to go to Europe because they want to stay close to their homeland. Some of them even have sort of relatives in a, in a larger sense uh, on the Turkish side of the border. That's why they choose to stay in Turkey. And Europe also has some leverage on Turkey on that. So we spent some billions uh, on uh, aid uh, on, uh, for, for Turkey uh, in in supporting uh, Syrian refugees, building schools, and all this stuff, so it's not a uni, it's not a one-way thing. It's uh, as very often in Turkish EU, EU relations, <laughs> it's a two-way thing, and that's why it's so so difficult, and that that's why this relationship is so important too. Great. Well, that's all we have time. I, I know that Knut will be very unhappy if you miss your train. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Schmidt for joining us and uh, <laughs> a very good conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.